Do you still have those moments of anger? Not anger, no. But no, when I work out, I'm angry. Yeah, that's true. When I'm working out, I'm fucking fierce. I'm screaming sometimes. Yeah. What do you, what do you attribute that to? Um, my experience in life, my experience in taking the toll. It's like a cigar. It is a cigar. It's it's a cigar. Has marijuana in it. it. Doesn't have tobacco. It's gonna kill me. You do what you want. I love I doing do what, what I want. want. <laughs> I love you, Jim, for that. <sighs> okay, we on the air. Everybody's ready, right? All right, bring us in, Mike. God damn, we need a ba- a fan in here, though. I'm gonna float <laughs> out of here. <laughs> no, man, come on, you guys are crazy. Let's go. Okay, this is another episode of Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson. I'm Evan Britton. And we have a real awesome guest here today, my buddy, you know what I mean, sportscaster extraordinaire, the great Hall of Famer, Jim <laughs> Gray. <laughs> What's up, Mike? Been a long time oh, with Mike. Man. We've been together a long time. That's right, man. Great you to be here have, with you. You guys have known each other a long time. Yeah. I know Mike since he was 16. How old are you now? Oh, I'm 52. That's a lot of years. Yeah. That's wow. a lot of years. We're coming up on, on 36 years. Oh, God. Wow. wow. Think about that. That was cra- it's crazy. We still alive. Remember when man. I met you? When, when, when? What day was that? Tell us. I met you. Uh, well, well you, were, you were training in the Catskills. I met you. And then uh, we had our first uh, I- interview back then, but... We then had our first real long conversation. You maybe nineteen or twenty. You came into Mateo's restaurant. Yeah, I remember Westwood. that. Yeah, remember that. I think that you was were fun. with Jimmy Jacobs, and, yeah, and that by was accident, fun. Don King was there. Yeah, that was. I remember Mateo was the best. Oh, in Westwood. Yeah, it was the best. Remember Maddie? Yeah, I remember him. Oh man, he would come by, introduce me to people and stuff. Everybody was in there. It used to be a restaurant on Sunday nights, and I well, tell them about this. The oh my believe. God! Everybody Sinatra gets. was in there. Lucille Ball, Sammy Davis, wow. anybody, Dean Martin, Bob Hope, Bob Any, Hope, anybody sitting there. Al right? Davis, it's chilling out, it, right? It was, it was incredible. It was it's fun. This is Westwood in L.A. Yeah, and Al Davis it's still there. Good. It's still there. It's on oh. Westwood and Pico. Yeah, it's oh, still wow. there. Still there. Wow, dude. It's changed hands. Maddie died, and uh, his wife Jackie. She sold it, and. Uh, but it it's was not it was, the same. No, it's it not can't the same. Be the same but the booths are still the same. same. They had that yeah. train up there. Oh, yeah, I remember you were man. watching that train. Remember that train was going around? Yeah, on the ceiling. Yeah, the, and, the they had a, and they had a uh, Cleveland Browns car because Art Modell was the owner of the Browns, and he used to be in there all the time. So they added a car, a Cleveland Browns a car on the train set. That was just oh, an awesome funny. place to be. That was just really at that time of my life, just going in there and seeing everybody, Bob Streisand, and it's seeing everybody, you're like, wow, it's, since you're a kid, you watch these guys on these late night television, Flip Wilson, all these guys, you're like, whoa, this is a trip. They were all in there. Johnny Carson, it was something. It was special. That's pretty special. That's, but anyway, we had our first con- real conversation there. He sat down at the table. He was looking at the train. The train was going round and round, and, and uh, I said, hey, Mike, and he had seen me on television, obviously, and I had interviewed him. He sat down, and uh, we had a conversation. I was with my dad, and then Mike. So Mike was maybe 19 or 20. Not sure exactly. But uh, every time I saw Mike after that, until my dad died about five or six years ago, every time I saw him, the first thing come out of Mike's mouth, it didn't matter where we were, what fight we were doing, whether it was Manchester or the MGM or anything, first thing he would say when he saw me, how's your dad, Jerry? You know, since you brought that up, you know, I met Jim, but what I always knew, I knew, always knew that um, for my brother, his father was just the man. You know what I mean? All the, um, the your father's associates and everything, um, Marvin Davis and all those guys, you know, your father was just the man, you know, and everybody always told me about your father, he was the man. Don King was saying he was the man. Everybody just had great reverence for your father. Well, he, he was, he was a great man. He really was, and he helped a lot of people. And um, tell us gave, about him. Come yeah. on, he tell gave me my love of sports, and he gave where, me. Where was he? Where he grew up at? Where was he? He grew born? up in Denver. Yeah, and he stayed in Denver his whole life, and he would travel around and uh, do his work. But uh, you know, he raised us in Denver, and um, my brothers were older than me, uh, so I got to spend a lot of time with my dad because my brothers were out of the house by the time I was, you know, old enough to, 
you know, really be able to do things and, and so forth. So we went to Bronco games and Rockets and Nuggets games, and he would take me down to the Golden Gloves. Golden Gloves was big in, in Denver, and every Christmas, uh, my dad loved boxing. My dad we used to go to all the fights, and he would drive us by uh, Sonny Liston's house. Yeah. Sonny Liston lived on Monaco Avenue, not far from where we lived uh, and grew up, and so we would go every Christmas, go to see his lights and hope to see him standing outside. He lived by Stapleton uh, Airport, which was the old airport in Denver. And we would go down there and, and look at that. And he would take me to watch Ron Lyle spar or Ron Lyle's fights. And uh, he, he just loved it. And uh, we would watch the fights on television, black and white, and uh, Bob Dumphy and then and, and Howard Cosell. And, and so, uh, you know, I was just uh, exposed uh, to it at a young age. Uh, you know, all those great, great fighters. And Denver was, you know, Denver had a, a big boxing community. Um, so... You know, I kind of fell in love with it, and 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 it just brought me closer to my dad. Not necessarily boxing, uh, but uh, just all the sports that. Uh, and I was a tennis player, so he would come to my matches, and and my mom, and you know, he just gave me the ability to do what I wanted to do, and 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 the freedom, uh, without interference. Uh, but the but the guidance and the love, uh, you know, that that that's required to to have a successful life, and. Um, so without that, you know, without, without pressing you or, or pushing you into what to do, he always just told me, you know, whatever you do, work hard and do it with integrity. And uh, so, um, you know, we miss him. He was my best friend. He, you know, it's a, it a tough, you know, everybody goes through it. Everybody loses loved ones. Uh, and then when it happens to you, uh, you lose your best friends and you've lost a tremendous amount of people in your life. Uh, you know that they're irreplaceable. You look for it in other people, but there isn't another father, and there isn't another best friend, and there isn't people who are in your circle that you really trust that you can find it from. Even though you try to gravitate to those people who you think might, it, it, it's just not the same. So I um, was lucky to have had him for the first, uh, whatever it was, 54 years of my life, and uh, my mom is still alive, and she's great. So the good news is when I see my mom, I feel my dad, and... Uh, She's still in Denver and rolling strong. And so tell me, what do you think? You made, met her. Made You've been know, her. I want to know about more. But what do you think made your father so influential? His honesty, his integrity, his principles. You know, he grew up in a time, you know, where you know people didn't have much, so they helped each other, and he saw you know, what his grandfather did in the community to help others who, who had come over from Europe, uh, who, who, you know, and then my dad was a Naval Reserve for, for the war. And so, you know, they knew, they knew that the times, you know, required that you had to figure out how to um, help others who didn't have what you had. So uh, my, my grandfather, was my great-grandfather, his grandfather, used to always tell him, Jerry, if you make a dime, you give someone a penny. If you make a dollar, you give someone 10 cents. If you make more than $100, you better give somebody more than $10. So he figured out, you know, that it was a, a, a if, if you ever became successful, that you had an obligation, uh, that, you, that there was a requirement uh, mm -hmm. morally to uh, do whatever you could to help others. So... My dad was a very philanthropic man. He got involved in all kinds of charities. I didn't even meet his friend. Did How he did he meet his friends? Yeah, all those guys, Marvin Davis and all those guys. Well, my dad was, a, was an accountant. By trade? That's what he did? Yeah, he was a, he was a, and he had a certified public accounting. Uh, but being uh, an accountant, just being an accountant, you know you get to know so many people? Yeah. Well, he ended, up, people ended, like up, he ended up doing the taxes for a lot of oh, people yeah. in, in, yeah. uh, in Colorado. And so, you know, he became trusted that, you know, he would handle people's uh, circumstances in, 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 in their accounting and, and you know, uh, figuring out ways how they could finance and, 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 and do things and, and, you know, being responsible uh, to paying the government and also, uh, you know, being able to fund some of the other stuff. So he was, uh, he was just trusted. How do you gain trust? Why do you trust me? It's just something you can't, really, you can't really put your finger on. You just know it. Our experience together. Correct. So I would know that Joe was a scumbag because all of, in, in the journeys of where we traveled, so we met a lot of bad people. So it would be easy for me to identify you as a bad person. 
Right. So that experience that he had with others led them to be able to know that he could facilitate a relationship and be counted on and be trusted. And he wow, really, it must have been powerful stuff. He really, that he gets really was. to trust so, you. He really was, and uh, you know, he was he was proud of, of all the things that he was able to uh, to accomplish, not only in business, but he was very proud of all the people that he helped who couldn't help themselves, uh, whether it was uh, guys who who were were nameless, uh, uh, you know, and and done anonymously, uh, which he did a tremendous amount of people for uh, for people who, you know. No one, not his friends, not even his family. I mean, I had a guy come up to me at his funeral, and he said to me, he said, do you have a moment? And I was just, we were just walking out of the funeral, and he said, can, can I talk to you for a moment? I want to tell you something about your dad that you don't know. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? This guy going to tell me I got a brother or something? I said, I don't need another brother that I don't know. I'm thinking... This goddamn guy, why are you going to tell me something about my dad that I don't know right now? And so I kind of looked at him, and I kind of kept walking. And he said, no, it's important. And I'm thinking, oh, God, my heart, you know, your heart kind of sinks. You ever had somebody come up to you? Absolutely. And you're thinking, oh, God damn, Yeah, no. when they serve you with some papers. <laughs> so he said to me, he said to me, you know, you, you, your dad was involved in something called the Bridge Foundation at the University of Denver. I said, yeah. He said he's a trustee, and he helped create the whole thing. And he said, yeah. And he said, there's tens of thousands of students who've been educated because of your dad's help. And they're all living much better lives because of what he was able to do and how he was able to help them all. And what the program was is if you could not afford college and you came from, I believe it was Denver Public Schools, and you couldn't afford it, he would bridge the gap. In other words, if you needed $100 more, he'd give you $100. If you needed $1,000, he'd give you 1000 They created this whole foundation to bridge the gap of what people could afford and what they couldn't afford so that they could then be educated. And uh, so he changed the lives of you know thousands of kids uh, and the community, and he left a part of himself to be able to help others for future generations. So... Uh, you know, it's a, it's 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 mind-boggling, you know, and That's that he amazing. had the time and, and and the inclination and the willingness to do that and all the other things that uh, he did. But uh, that one, I walked away from, I walked away from like that guy That's and I felt trick. great. But I wanted to I wanted to smack him at first. <laughs> <laughs> how so, do you live up to something like that? You can't. Yeah, it was, how do you, you can't. But it's a great like example, that? and you yeah. just. Um, That's what you hope to do in life. He always used to say to me, if you can help somebody, help them. If you can't, you hope they understand. Hmm. So uh, you try to do the best you can and, um, you know, as a great role model, you, you, it's, it's hard to, you can't fill those shoes. Nobody can. But you can try and do your best. And uh, the great example that he and my mom have set and uh, just the honesty and decency and integrity. And I'm glad you got to know him a little bit. And uh, what you said to me at the Hall of Fame uh, again uh, last year, you know, that made me cry before we started, when you started to cry. That was, uh, I wasn't expecting that. But I can't tell you how much that meant to me because you could go to a place that I wasn't going to go, you know. I wasn't going to take the people there, and he did. That was a great moment. Thank you, brother. You know, um... It's going going with this journey in life with you, you know what I mean? Knowing you as a human being, a person, knowing what you experienced with, you know, this bullshit from people, from shit with me and shit with um, Pete Rose and all that shit. And you know, um, the only thing that I, I realized you experienced what I experienced, we never gave up. No matter what anybody said to us, they tried to break our spirits, you know, destroy how we felt about ourselves, our confidence, you just never gave up in life like that. You know, I was kind of fortunate just in my own brain that, to think that, you know, when people have opinions, they're entitled to their opinions. And if we're going to dish it out, we should be able to take it. So when people give you a hard time, even when they don't have all the facts, you got to correct the facts, but opinions are okay. Everybody has an opinion. And that opinion, even if you disagree with it, doesn't mean that they can't have it. But it doesn't mean that you have to believe it. So who am I going to believe? 
some guy who doesn't know me, some guy who, 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 for whatever the reason, has venom or anger or jealous or petty or... And by the way, sometimes the criticism's correct. And when the criticism's correct, you got to do your best to take it to heart and change. I mean, if somebody says something about you and you know it's true, don't fight it. Fix it. Right? 100%. Yeah. So sometimes you, sometimes you just have to fix it. Sometimes you got to take your medicine when you're wrong. And when you're not wrong, well, I just disregard it because what does it matter what they think? Yeah. Does it matter to you what somebody thinks that doesn't no, know you? Not at all. It matters to me when my wife's mad at me. It matters to me when you're mad at me. It matters to me when people who know me and care about me, when they're pissed off, I better look at myself and, and get it right. Hey, what do you think about this? Um, you know, well, he didn't think that. I was speaking earlier. Um, I took this ancient drug, the TMD. Um, explain to um, Jim what DMT. It is. DMT. 5-DMT. 5-MEO. 5-MEO, DMT. Yeah. I don't know what that is. It's a, it's a hallucinogenic, some, so to speak, isn't it? Yeah, it's a entheogenic. So it, it helps people dealing with depression, anxiety, addiction, cancer. Um, you experience an ego death. You is it legal? It's legal in ceremonial medicinal settings. And you can go is to Mexico. legal in the United States? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Depends it's great. If, depends if it's an Indian reservation yes. or something to that effect. Okay, so where are we going with this? What does this got so, to do with so it? Listen, this is, is going to be so interesting. That's why I'm saying this. Um, um, so I, I, I experienced with this, um, how do we call it? What do we call it? This ancient... Ancient medicine. Medicine. And man... Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking about doing this because I'm, I'm not worrying about doing drugs. The guy explained this is a magic drug. It's a god monocle and stuff. And I'm saying, oh, really? I, I'm, I'm high on cocaine. So I, yeah, let me see what you got, okay? Let me see what the fuck you got. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so I go in the back. The guy said, not now. Let's finish the conversation because I'm interviewing him. So he's talking about this. And I said, oh, I can't wait. To do You're so full of shit. I'm telling you, you can't do this. And so I go in there, right? And I smoked, and man, I, used to, I said, I'm dead. Holy shit. I, the first thing I said, I'm dead. These people killed me. Holy shit. Where is this? What country? Um, it's close by. <laughs> <laughs> it's close by, right? This guy, Dr. Jerry, comes uh, from Mexico. He's a shaman. He's performed thousands of these ceremonies. And Sorry, I, Mike, go yeah, ahead. Don't worry about it. And then, um, I, <laughs> oh, I see you won't believe this. You got to see this. I've been everywhere experience. with you. I'm not going to not believe anything because I've so, seen it all. Every time all I said sudden, I can't I took, believe it, I've been with drug, Mike. Yeah. Okay. I took this drug. I disintegrated. I have no longer a physical being. I'm just all spiritual being. There's nothing physical about me, and I'm just... I'm just gone, and I'm, I'm dying, and um, it's over. Everything is um, marginalized. It's just, it's, and um, I'm, I'm happy with that. No one's in my life. No wonder you got all these millions of people watching this. No. This some crazy <laughs> shit. See, okay. I know. So I said, so all of a sudden. So what's the question? All of a sudden, I ask God, I just, and I ask God, I want power. I want power. And all of a sudden, I disintegrated. That must have been a hell of a trip. Oh, man. Well, Mike is really, it's, it seems I, I like. Did, my, first, my first trip, I did it five times. Mike has been better released. Better slow down, buddy. No way, slow man. Down, buddy. Tell you, no Jim. way, Jim. No way. I'm seeing, I'm, I'm experiencing God. Jim, this guy God. is so I'm much lighter. I'm God. When I first met this guy so six God. months ago, he was doing well, but he had a lot on him. You know, obviously, he's been through hell and back. Well, when you alter all these chemicals in your brain and you start taking this stuff, yeah, well, this is going to be a little lighter. Yes, this is crazy. It'll be, be careful. <sighs> no, I'm, watch out what you're doing. I'm not afraid. Okay, absolutely I'm not afraid. All right, definitely, death is not even a, is existence. You know? I don't even know how to respond to that. So, well, let's go on to the next there. one. <laughs> okay, Jim, you got, you've interviewed this guy a lot. Yep. Right? Uh -huh. Is it funny to be on the other side of the, the mic? No. I, we, no? We, 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 I did a podcast with him a year yeah, or two ago. Oh, podcast. Bite the Mic? Yeah. Yeah, nice. I did that one. And, you know, I've hung, we've hung out together in, 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 you know, just where, you know, we just shared life's experiences. And, we've and, been all over the world together. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we have a relationship. Yeah. We have a friendship. I trust Mike. And like I said at the Hall of Fame last year, without Mike... 
you know, I wouldn't be where I am today. He's been an important part of my career. Uh, he's he's trusted me, and um, in many ways, standing next to Mike, you know, along with others along the way, uh, you know, made me famous, if that's the right word. You know, you really are famous, Jim Gray. Well, I don't know about that. I don't even. I don't <laughs> even. Really like, I don't famous, like that though. word, but because of all of the attention that Mike you attracted and all of his fame, <laughs> when you're standing next to him, and he's doing all this stuff, and he's. You know, said his back is broken and he's bitten some guy's ear off and he's won championships <laughs> and he's the youngest heavyweight ever. It's not just the, the, the you know, the crazy stuff, but it's the uh, immortal stuff for boxing and for sports that he accomplished. You know, you get the benefit of that. You get, you get, you derive all of the accolades that he is accepting because you're standing there next to him talking. So you, you, you get a lot of uh, great benefits and I've been able to benefit by having been able to interview Mike at all of these times when the public, when he had the public's attention, and not only was it, you know, in this country, but it was worldwide, and, and, and you know, his greatness, all of us at Showtime, all of us in boxing, he elevated all of that. So uh, I've always been grateful to Mike, and so, so you know. What was that Savarese fight like? You know, what was the excitement like? You know, I couldn't enjoy it. Like, crazy, like, the, the big, I beat up Frank Warren, is skeptical, am I going to go to prison after the fight? What's going to happen? And then the fight's over quick, and what the hell are you thinking? What do you guys say? The fight is fucking over. I'm going to put that story, when I if, if I ever write my book, I'm going to put that story in the book. I'm not going to put it on this podcast. <laughs> oh, <dang it. laughs> oh, God. I'm going to put that story in the, in the, in the book, but... Uh, Oh, uh, shit. But, I mean, let me tell you something. If I really, you know, if I really sat here and thought about it, you could do a book on Mike of everything, and he's done his, sto he's done his story. Yeah. He's done uh, Undisputed. And let me tell you something. He's left a lot of shit out of this. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of material here. <laughs> there's volumes. <laughs> and I don't know if it's because uh, it didn't rank on top or if it's because he didn't want that exposed or if he's saving it all for the next chapter and the next yeah. chapter and the next chapter. But let me tell you something. Every time you said, I can't believe what I just saw or I can't believe that we just experienced it, something else happened. <laughs> and here we go again. Fuck. Here what was it like again. being on a plane that wasn't what's going to happen next? Right? What's going to happen at this fight? You never uh, knew. You never knew and you still don't know. I mean, you still don't, uh, you know, it's a journey. Yeah, and it it's, is. And it's, it's, you know. What am I doing with some going. podcast? What am I doing with a podcast? I thought all this stuff right? was for weirdos at first. Yeah. Everybody was on podcasts and on their phones people. and stuff and on YouTube. Are you on your phone all the time? Are you one of these no, guys? No, no. The only people, the only person I call is my kids You're and my wife. You're not looking at this thing. No way. way. You're no not way. Way. Never. No. Okay. They don't have me. This company has me now. Really? So you don't get yeah. on the telephone? No. No, okay. no. I don't leave anybody. I'm never out of my wife's and children's sight for more than a couple of hours. How, you, how have you figured out how not to be addicted to the phone like everybody else? Everybody I want is hands distance. You know, my children, my wife, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, uh, my friends, I come to work with them. We're all in distance. I don't know. Everything I want is relatively close. And let's go back to the people who, who, who you began your life with. Are yeah, any of them in that. your life? No. I, just, I don't know what they're doing in their life or nothing. You don't ever see them? Like, you know, so Rory and John Horn, never. never I don't mean them. them. Uh, uh, um, uh, Teddy. No. Kevin. No. Any of Cuss's people? <sighs> yeah, Tom Patty. Tom Patty, okay. Yeah. And how about the Jacobs family or the Caton I family? I don't, I don't even see those guys. Never saw those guys. Don King's family. No. Don. I, I called Don the other day just to say I apologize. You did? Wow. Yeah. What did he say? Don, um, Don's a good man, but Don just don't get it, you know? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. If Don probably thought I was trying to set him up on the phone or something. Or I don't know. He's he's very protective. He he was skeptical. He was very skeptical. He wasn't. He you know. And at the end, he went, at the end, I thought he he may believe that I was being sincere. He said, "Hey, you're really a good person." You know. I said, "Well, thank you." You know, thank you. But he nice. was very. But that was good. You called. Yeah, but what he was caused very, that? It was very protective, huh? What caused that? I don't know because I had a really nasty feeling in my my body for throwing that water in his face the, the last time I saw him. That was that was that was. 
yeah. the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I feel so sickening about that because I was watching YouTube and YouTube showed them and showed them throw the water and I said, wow, and I didn't feel good about that. I didn't like the way that picture looked. So I called and apologized and stuff. Mm. Well, maybe that, maybe, wow. That's awesome, Mike. Yeah. Okay, good. I shouldn't be doing no shit like that. I've been to too, I've been to too much bullshit in my life to be throwing waters in people's face. Like I'm a tough guy. All that tough guy stuff got me in so much trouble. Oh, I remember when I used to think I was a tough guy and it got me in all that trouble. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, Jim. God. Jim, what was it like getting in the ring after this guy fought to interview him? I don't know what the hell I'm going to say. He was like breathing <laughs> fire, dude. He's like an unchained tiger. Well, you know, I'm going to say, you know, it's funny. You didn't know what he was going to say, but he always was respectful to me and he was and he, and of the position. So, you know, he never got nasty with me. He never got angry with me. One time he threatened to kill me. I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> he threatened to kill me and Don King. He threatened to kill me and Don King. And, and he said, I'll kill you and I'll kill Don King. He was mad at Don. <laughs> and he said, and I, and I kind of looked at him. And 45 seconds later, he kissed me on my cheek. Oh, my God. And it was far more disturbing that he kissed me yeah. <laughs> than it was that he threatened to kill me. So, I mean... Other than that one forty-five second thing, he was he was he was on time, courteous to me and the people at Showtime. Um, even in his craziest moments, he never lashed out at any of us that I can remember. But then I wanted to Did kill you? you and no, not that I remember. I wanted to kill you and Don King. <laughs> I think he just said it because it was an easy way to get to Don. Oh, <laughs> I'll, I'll kill you and Don. Don was standing behind us. Oh no. Why did you? I don't know why you said it. What were you mad at him about? I don't know. Was um, that after you'd thrown him out of the car or kicked him out of the car or whatever? I have no idea, man. I have no idea. <laughs> Do you remember all this stuff? I remember a, a few things, yeah, a few things. I remember being in Miami and um, we're driving down. What is that, the 10 in Miami? What is that in Miami? 305? No. It's going, it's going towards um, West Palm Beach. I don't know Miami. I don't that know well. Miami. I don't. twenty to ten. I don't know something. And then, um, it's that freeway that's always busy. Yes. Yeah. And so we're before the turnpike, we're driving on on the turnpike, and next thing you know, I just freak out and I kick the guy. In the, and as soon as I kicked him in the back of his head, or he puts on the brake and we stop in the middle of the street and I'm just beating him in the car. I'm trying it's to done. Get, yeah, I'm trying to get um, <laughs> I'm trying to get the girl in the front seat. who's a friend of mine to hold him before I can get in the front seat with him because I want to get him in the front seat where he can't run. Cause I got him in the back and I can't get him the way I want to because I'm in back of him and I'm in the car. So I wanted to get out and so I told her to hold him. So as soon as I let him go, he got the car, right? He got out the car, so I tried to run. Oh, man. God. This is on the highway. Yeah. <laughs> and you just left him on the highway. No, no. He ran a car, so I tried to run the car, so he did another back turn and got back in the front and drove off and left me <laughs> on left the you. highway. Oh, oh, he left you. He left me on the highway, Fuck. yeah. <laughs> oh, but no, no, no. Check this out, all right? Oh. I'm on the highway, right? I'm on the highway. <laughs> so when he gets down there, he gets these real far, so he left the people who I was with, my girlfriend and my other friend, he left them out the car, and they're walking up the highway while cars are coming down, and they're walking up the highway while they come to get me. And so... So one of his security guys in the roads where he comes, he thinks that we're, we're we're stuck on the road. So he pulls over, and I'm mad because he's throwing security. I give him a shot. Bow! Oh. Out cold, right in the middle of the street. <laughs> in the highway. It's out cold. Cars are coming. The police car comes. A police car comes, and the car's out. The guy's shoes in. The, the cop picks up me. I have cocaine. I have marijuana. I have it in a box that my girlfriend is holding, right? Uh, the guy gets us in. The cop puts us in the car. Me, Jackie, Luz, and myself, he puts us in the car, drives us to a hotel, and says, are you okay, Mr. Tyson? Thank you very much, officer. And leaves us up there. I have cocaine in a box. I have marijuana in a box. A big box like this. <laughs> Ooh, but a fucking brick of cocaine. I got fucking marijuana, everything in there. And, um, are you okay, he, Mr. Tyson? Yes, he just took me right to my hotel room and everything. I'm, I'm stuck on the highway. I should be in handcuffs. I'm on the highway. Somebody's out cold on the highway he should put me in handcuffs we should be in the cop car and we should be going but the guy put us in um the car took us to our hotel and he then he asked you go. why you was out there excuse me he didn't ask you why he you didn't ask me shit <laughs> <laughs> i was so my heart was beeping the girl's heart would be like, I'm, ready. I'm, I'm thinking he's taking us to the police station he took us right to our hotel <laughs> wow that's amazing 
to go back to our hotel. I can't even believe it. I, you know, I can't even believe it. He didn't say a word. He drove us, and we're holding the drugs in the box and he stuff. He was so stoked. And he just, he just took us, and he said, okay, Mr. Titan, yes, sir, thank you, officer. Were you the heavyweight champion at the time? No. No, it was my <laughs> last fight. I didn't have no money. I was broke. I was I was destitute. Don, you know, did what he ever did to me, and I was. I don't even know what I was doing out there. Now let me ask you a question. What? I want to. I want to ask you a question. What did you do with all that money? <sighs> hey, I just gave a lot of it away. I had a lot of fun, and fuck, I <laughs> did what I wanted nice. to do. I, just, I had a lot of fun. Um, when I was a kid, I used to have a really good time. I was all over the world. I was in San Pay doing, oh, forget it, with awesome people, wealthy uh, We just, it was almost, um, it was almost so bad. It felt so good. It felt wrong. You know, it just felt wrong. It just felt wrong to have all this ecstasy, have all this sensation, have all this fun, and all this wealth. It just didn't feel, it felt wrong, but it was awesome. <laughs> Do you miss it? No, no. It's gonna happen again, but not the way it happened last time. Mm. You know. So do you? But I always was amazed. I, I guess you're supposed to ask the question, but I always was amazed that that you haven't had regret for that portion. No, I mean, you may the, you may have regret in other things that you've done and 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 feel bad and apologized or 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 whatever. But for the way you lived your life with that money. No, I don't have no regrets, but maybe some, but no. As I got older, I say no, because when I was young, I said maybe I should have regrets, you know? But uh, I should have regrets because my life should be, the, it should be different than it is now. Mm. But it, it's the way it's supposed to be now because it's prepared for grander things. Now that I'm in the stage of being able to understand them and handle them. Before, I'm surprised that I'm not dead for the way I lived my life. <laughs> You know what I mean? I'm just surprised at how disrespectful I was, you know, during that time thinking that I was God. You know what I mean? I had some tough friends, so if you don't agree with me, you're going to be in some trouble. You won't go out with me, all right? Your boyfriend's in trouble now. Just, you know what I mean? It's it was, interesting because I've heard you say that, Mike, and then, you know, Jim talks about how respectful you were to have been to him and to his father, and I've heard that. All the time. And yeah, I listen, see you act, and you have a ton of respect. That's awesome, and humility. Too. You know, I learned you know? that from Cuss, too. But this is how it was going to be. I'm going to kiss the ring. That's right. You're the man. I'm going to kiss the mm -hmm. ring. But the people below me, they're going to kiss my ring, too. Uh, that's the old mic right there. You got yeah. that. Yeah. There we go. I There's hear that emotion. Fire. No, but it's not, it's, it's <laughs> not about no, that. Yeah, totally. That, that was makes sense. It, it was never about that, but that's the way I was raised. You know, yeah. you kiss the ring, but they're going to kiss yours, too, one yeah. day. You know, but that was yeah. all ridiculous. The, yeah. When I took the toll, what I realized and understood about the toll, we all bowing down to God. Mm. We're all the strongest, the most powerful, the richest, the weakest. We're all going to bow down to God or something bigger than us. A higher power. Why, why do you have a tattoo of Days of Grace and Arthur Ashe and, and Chairman Mao? I just, I'm just very fascinated with both of them. I thought they were awesome individuals and stuff. I really... um. When I was in prison, I really wanted I almost got, um, it was almost like a hypnotic effect they had on me when I was in prison. In what way? On how to, how to better myself and strengthen myself for revenge. Against? Myself. You wanted society. revenge against society you know, and yourself. Yeah, society that put me in here and lied on me. But it was really a blessing in disguise, you know, because I started to learn who I could really be. Not who I wanted to be, but who I could be at that particular stage of my life. And what did you learn? Huh? What was it that you learned from them? That I learned that um, we're all going to make mistakes in life. But when we make those mistakes, we're going to allow those mistakes to become blueprints to a bigger, a bigger part of our success in our life and, and in civilization. So you were in the right place at the right time for the wrong reason? Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Mm. I think if I didn't go to prison, I would have AIDS or something. Want to explain that? Yeah, it's, it's people were really, my, a lot of my friends were dying. They're getting sick and dying. You know, reckless lifestyle, reckless sexual appetites. And I was on that same wagon with them. So if I didn't get that three years, I would have probably been in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Wow. And jail pulled you out of that? Yeah, big time. 
I was an absolute um, slave to sensation when I was a young kid. When I was fighting on the before I went to prison, I was just a slave. If it felt good, I did it. No matter what it was, or what it, who it was, if it felt good. Hmm. So whether it was sex or drugs or anything. hitting somebody in the head, whatever made you anything that felt that, good, being disrespectful. It was, if it felt good, I did it. And how did prison break that? Just the inability to have freedom? No, I wanted to be in control of myself. I just wanted revenge. I didn't understand. I thought going to prison, I was. I thought I was. The, I thought I was this dumb motherfucker, Alexander Dumas. Who was the, who was this guy? He wrote the book about the guy. Who was the guy that went to prison? Count of Monte Cristo. Yeah, I was reading that. I thought I thought I was that guy. Am I a fucking idiot? To believe that this was that kind of harsh punishment. I thought every, this was the worst thing that could happen to a human being. I only did three fucking years of my life, and I had a ball in prison. I had a girlfriend. I got a girl pregnant in prison. I was living a life in prison. How did you do that? I just, it's just, it was meant to be. I was Mike Tyson. Anybody gave me what I want. And I feel like a dick even talking like I'm some tough guy or some cool guy. I was just a pig. Who brought you the women? They worked there. They're my teachers. And did she have the child? No. I told you there's a lot of chapters in there. There's a lot of layers. Mike, when's the book coming out? No, nah, not about no book. It's just that um. No, this real life. That was um. That was just real. That was just real life. I was a savage. I wanted to survive. I thought everything I needed to survive. I needed to survive. I couldn't. But you know, I'm surprised I wasn't getting high because in my mind I wasn't. I couldn't. I couldn't succeed and survive. I did drugs and got high, so, so I didn't get high in prison. How many people would you say have that experience in jail? You describe jail as being a good experience. I don't know. I'm sure. Listen, um, I didn't want to leave when I left. Why? Because I was secure, I was safe. Safe from yourself? Safe from society? Safe from both? Who? Both. Society so was there a judgment? Uh, was there a, 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 a was it a tough um, a reacclimation? Um, big time, big time, big time. Yeah, I really didn't know what I was doing when I came out of prison. Hmm. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. It's always fascinating to talk to Mike. I'm, I'm, I'm I have so much. This podcast has so much go fun, everywhere. I have so much fucking vin, vindictiveness, venom in me. I wanted revenge. I thought somebody you still have did it. something I still hear to it. me. I hear the old Mike in you here. You know, but they didn't do anything. I used to think that someone did something to me because I thought that shouldn't have happened to me. Even though I took it as experience, of the best experience of my life, I still feel like it was somebody did this to me. Instead of looking at this as your best experience to find out more about you, that you still nothing that you think is something. Even at my the worst, the worst, the bottom as I can be, you know what I mean? I might see a fucking mirror and say, "Wow, I'm good looking. I can brush my fucking hair." You know, my ego will always come up some kind of way. I don't care how I try to crush it. You, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Absolutely. Yeah. Do you still have those moments of anger? Not anger, no. But no, when I work out, I'm angry. Yeah, that's true. When I'm working out, I'm fucking fierce. I'm screaming sometimes. Yeah. What do you, what do you attribute that to? Um, my experience in life, my experience in taking the toad. You know, I might scream out, I'm a fucking God, and then say, excuse me, I'm so sorry I said that, God. This toad thing needs more examination, but... The toad thing didn't come into your life until recently, so yeah. the anger's been there all your how old? Fifty no. three years? Yeah, but it's but it's not towards anybody. There's no physical being that caused my anger. Nothing from a physical perspective, not a human being, anything I can name or anything that breathes or doesn't cause my anger. It's all internal. All internal, yeah. And how would you describe yourself the internal equilibrium of Mike Tyson these days? I, I would like forgiveness from Mike Tyson, yeah. You, you're trying to forgive yourself? Yes. Have you succeeded in some aspects? Yeah, there's a certain part of me that don't like myself and think I should punish more. 
punish yourself more. Yeah, that you had too much of a fucking good time. So you feel guilty about yourself? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes. And how do you? How are you ever going to reconcile that? Hey, that's not me to find out. It's, it just happens, you know. It just happens. Well, if you don't have any control of that path, if there's no, if there's no way of knowing what the next step in the journey is, if there's no thought process and you're just reacting. Well, my reaction did pretty good. I'm doing pretty good with reaction, you know what I mean? Because it's not meant for me to think, you know. It's my life that I have nothing to do with. My life has nothing to do with me. My actions have nothing to do with my life because my life is on a divine path. It has nothing so to do with me. So you're not in me. control of yourself? Excuse me? So you're not in control of yourself or you are? Not from, from a divine perspective, no. From an action perspective? Absolutely. I can only, I can only be controlled on me and be um, concerned with my actions. Nothing else truly exists in that that particular realm. What do you think, Jim? Mike always makes me think. No, I'm just. No, I mean I have to. I uh, yeah. You. I think about the fact when I look look at my wife and I think about the fact that um, this is this is um this is not actually my wife. This is um, this is God's creation, and I have no control over that. There's no way I can ever control that. That's a powerful realization with your spouse. The fear that, that I can't that I can't have that. That one day I may lose that from health reasons, the death reasons, of just reasons that I don't understand why. And that could be a possibility. And that could be my biggest fear. And I have to look at that as it's, it's God's will. Let's talk about flip. I spoke to somebody about <laughs> Flip um, two days ago. I spoke to somebody about Tell Flip. Tell everybody who Flip was. Flip, listen. Flip was this guy that had, this is really interesting. Flip was this guy that had a lot of um, influential pull in all the hotels. And this is the 80s. Tell them what 80s. Flip was. I thought pimp Flip was a pimp. I didn't he know. Flip, Flip was an original pimp. Was he really? I guess. I don't, I don't know, know. But I knew, this is I what I found out was. recently but about Flip. Flip, Flip, was, Flip was like, uh, Flip this, was StubHub yeah. long before StubHub. Listen, this is what I found out recently Flip about Flip had 5,000 tickets to yes. everything. He, uh, he was something. Wow. <laughs> this guy was dressed impeccably. Black guy. Yeah. I mean, this Matt guy would tall wear, like, guy, long beautiful, baby blue one day, royal blue the next day. He had a beautiful you know, green hat. You don't see people like this. They don't make people like this no more. These guys have written out of history, man. You can't believe this. He was guys. at every fight. Ali's fights. Yeah, he was at Agler Ali's fights. He's always Ray asking Leonard's me if I want fights. tickets to any of the concerts right. as he got them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he had all the Sinatra, Andy Williams. This guy had everything, and he would sit. Where would he sit? In the in the in the goddamn hotel with the um, front bar of Caesars. Yeah, and he, everything was. Caesars I mean, Joe and Lewis used to be the greeter, but they everybody too. came to see Flip. Really? Everybody Flip knew Joe Lewis too. Remember Joe yeah. Lewis used to be. Standing? I wasn't around when Joe Lewis was the guy. Oh, Joe. I Joe used to, Joe used to be in Caesars, and he would he would, he was a greeter. Yeah. Yeah. What was that like seeing him every day? What did your father was, tell it, you about it, him? It was great because he was an American hero. He was an international treasure. And then you'd see him and he'd be talking to these people. You know, the Caesars, you know, the government uh, had taken a lot of his money. He hadn't paid his taxes or he, they were after him for whatever the reason. And uh, so it was kind of sad that here was this great American hero and he was shaking hands with everybody in the casino. So it was, But he was pleasant. You know, he was happy with his, you know, he was... He was very nice. I mean, you know, I remember when my dad, I was just a little boy. My dad, and then, you know, we went back and, you know, it's not like YouTube or anything. If you wanted to find out about somebody, you had to get the encyclopedia or you had to go get a book. Go to the library. Do physical work and go to the library. So it wasn't like there was just film sitting around of Joe Lewis. You had to go search and seek this stuff out. And so he taught me about him and, you know, and so it was, you know, it was like you became in awe. And then you'd see him the next time, and you had that history now in your head because you'd been taught about him. And um, he was great, but I'm telling you, it, he had a crowd around him. Everybody wanted to say hello to Joe. Everybody wanted to say hello to Joe, but everybody went to flip to get something done. Oh, man. <laughs> Listen, Joe Lewis set a new um, standard, you know, because now people do that for a living. 
Mm-hmm. Meet and greet. We do that for a living. You know how much when people become millionaires, meeting and greeting people that normally would have been bums, would have been sleeping in their cars, or would have just turned well, into alcoholics. The, the memorabilia age now and oh, the autographs, Joe these. Lewis would have been. Holy moly. When he did he that. die? I forget when he died. Early well, 80s? Listen, no, he died the day Larry Holmes fought. Cooney? He, um, no, Trevor Burbick, 81, 82. Yeah, that's what I said, early like 80s, yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Yeah, but he this guy was something. But when did Flip die? He had to die in the late eighties and nineties. Wait, wait, he wasn't around 90s. for the Tyson Holyfield. He wasn't. I don't think he was around for that stuff. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, when when the fights left Caesars, you didn't see him much anymore. So. We had fun back then, Jim. There was a lot of stuff. What were your guys doing when your guys were all on the plane? All the reporters on the plane together. Well, what I you talk on, about? You know, I, I, I used to go to fights early, and you know, who else yeah. used to come early. Oh. Every and he was at all your fights too. Who's that? John Madden used to really? come in on the bus, and we would sit. Remember that? Did uh, he really? Oh yeah, at Caesars. John would come on Tuesdays. And John, John used to uh, have all of the uh, closed circuit fights for the Oakland area. He was like the distributor, so he would get all the fights to deliver to the fans. And and John loved boxing. I mean, John's a huge. He still watches the fights to this day. He still awesome. texts me and yeah. talk to me about Tell it. But anyway, say hi, man. So see. John, you remember there used to be that little elevator and that glass thing that went up at Caesars right before you went out of the pool. I forget what the name of that. I don't remember. Yeah, you go out to the pool and there was this little bench right there, and Madden used to sit there on, on that bench, and he'd come in on Tuesday, and we would, and Gil Clancy would come by, and Tim Ryan would come by, and Dick Young, and. All uh, those Dick old, Young was the man. All these writers would come, you know, come by and, and sit down and talk to Madden, and he would just kind of hold court there, and he would sit and, you know, he was a Super Bowl winning coach, and he was in his, you know, the beginning of his broadcasting career, and they would send him, like, for CBS Sports Spectacular to, to interview the fighters before the fights. So, you know, he would have Ray Leonard on, or he would have Hagler on, or Hearns, or Duran, or whoever it was, Whitaker, you know, any of those guys, Arguello, all those old guys that used to fight, you know, on, on CBS and uh, or before their their uh, closed circuit fights, so I used to sit there with John all week because we'd be the only people that would get there on Tuesday. You know, I'd get there early to do you know because Top Rank had hired me, uh, Bob Arum had hired me to do you know all of his satellite interviews, and, and Don then Don hired me to do all that, uh, all these uh, interviews. So I would hang out with John Madden. He became a dear dear friend, and I, I love John. And John was brilliant. Is brilliant. He's a genius. Uh, he was a genius about people, a genius about real estate, a uh, genius about football, and he became the most popular figure in the history of professional football. You know, Madden, Madden, the game Madden yeah, now today is, crazy. is, you know, it's, it's, it, not only did he win uh, more games, uh, he, won, he won more games to 100. He was the, the, the youngest coach to win 100 games first, then he won a Super Bowl. Uh, with the Raiders, and then he, you know, had this incredible broadcasting career. He won like twenty-five or thirty Emmys, the best broadcaster forever. I mean, yeah, and then John he created awesome. Madden game. So, but he loved boxing, and we, we used to talk about you all the time. Really? Oh my God! I don't say, is Mike Tyson crazy? What do you say, Mike? That no, he, he, John had respect. John had deep respect for athletic ability. Really? Oh my God! And he 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 was he was enamored by it. He was uh, he he thought. You know, he he thought that the guys that put in the work that rose to the top step of the victory platform were guys who earned their way, that you couldn't bullshit that. You know, you could bullshit in life, and you could make a team, and you could get on television and not know your stuff. You, you know, you could, and Madden would always say, that guy's a bullshit, that guy's a bullshit. But then when they, when champions and, and, and true great players and great athletes, he was he was really had tremendous admiration and respect and uh John's still doing good. John's up in Oakland, Pleasanton. Nice. Coach Madden, yeah. That's he he retired hear. and he's one of the only two people I know in my life that walked away when he was on top in television. Only only two people quit television. Otherwise television quits you. Yeah. Johnny Carson and John Madden left while they still had a lot left in them. Hmm. Surprised you never met Coach Matt. Um, I did an interview with him a couple oh. of times. I oh, remember you did. seeing the interview I did with him. Yeah. Okay. Good. So yeah, you know. That's cool. Yeah. Jim, were you? Um, was your line through journalism? 
Were you really, did you as a kid, you wanted to follow that? Were you interested in being a sports writer? Like, how did you come? Yeah, how you get involved with this stuff? How did you get stuff? to this point? I love sports, and I was a tennis player, and uh, played tennis in high school, and we were city champions and so forth in uh, in Denver growing up, and uh, I loved I loved sports and playing sports and watching sports, and so when I was a freshman, uh, uh, summer freshman college going to, uh, uh, I went down to the ABC station in Denver and asked for an internship or a job, and they didn't have anything. And they said, if you get into school, college, you'll get an, come back and try for an internship. So I went to college, and the first day I was on campus, I saw the man who I interviewed with. He said, go over to the journalism school and try and get an internship. So I got an internship. I was there for a month or two, and they were converting from film to videotape. So all the guys who were in the union for the film took the buyout. So they hired me, and uh, I got hired as a videotape editor. Nobody knew how to videotape editors. So they were, I was 17 or 18 years old, so they were teaching every, you know, see, so yeah, that's good. So they paid me a lot of money. Paid me like $25,000 when I was 17 years old. That's crazy. And yeah. I, thought that was, I thought that was more money than oh, I'd ever have. So I was, awesome. able, I was able to buy my car. It was a Toyota Corolla, and that cost like $1,700. And then I bought beer for everybody, you know, in the dorm. I'd get a cake for them every week. And I still had twenty five, twenty two thousand dollars after that, you know. So, I, so anyway, one day I was in my edit booth. I was editing. A Red Miller was the head coach of the Denver Broncos. I was editing the Red Miller show at seven thirty in the morning. And the lady who was the head of the bureau for assignments came running and she says, "You know, you know some, you know something about sports, don't you?" And I said, "Yeah, a little bit." She said, "Muhammad Ali's at the airport. He took an earlier plane. He's two and a half hours early. <laughs> Go out and interview him." Because back then, there were no cell phones. There were no beepers. There were no computers. No, yeah. no, no. If you did not answer your home telephone, they couldn't find you. Right. So they couldn't find the, the anchor man. They couldn't find the lead sports guy. They couldn't find any of the reporters. They couldn't get any. Nobody's answering their phone. They were sleeping. They were in the shower. They were breakfast. No, God knows where they were. No pages back then. None. Nothing. So, so I ran into the weatherman's office, took his coat and tie. <laughs> Didn't fit. It was a little itty-bitty guy named Stormy, and the sport coat came up to here. <laughs> so I took it off, but I took his shirt. In his tie, and I went out and interviewed Ali. Oh my God! Ali was coming to town. He was going to talk. He was talking about his fight with Spinks was coming up, and then he was going to fight a guy named Lyle Alzado, who was a Denver Bronco. Yes. In an exhibition after the Spinks fight. That's right. So I interviewed him. He gave me forty-five minutes. He was great at the airport. Um, he was just—he was just <laughs> wonderful. He was patient. He was nice. He was funny. He was thoughtful. He was all those things. He called me the uh, the local young Howard Cosell. <laughs> so anyway, so I took the interview back and was going to edit myself out of, you know, they weren't going to put it, me on the air. I was, you know, I wasn't on the air. So the head of the bureau came in there, the head, the news director, a guy named Roger Ogden, and he looked at this, and I don't think this guy even knew my name. You know, he didn't even know me. And he said, you, you interviewed Ali today? I said, yeah. He said, let me see it. Showed him all 45 minutes he said, let me see that again. He, so he spent an hour and a half with me, and he looked at me, and he said, we're going to put you and this on the air. It's barely adequate. So I tell everybody I've been barely adequate ever since. <laughs> so, that, so, so ABC saw, the people there at the, at the station saw that Ollie took a liking to me for whatever the reason. So they then sent me to all of his fights to do an interview. Well, then Bob Arum saw that. Wow. And he hired me. Don King saw that, and he hired me. So I worked for top rank and for King Vision, you know, top rank first, you know, doing all these interviews before the fights with all the fighters and then after the fights. And then they would put them up, you know, on these satellites in the early advent of satellites, and uh, all the, everybody would take them down and use these interviews, and it would help them, you know, promote their the early days of pay-per-view was closed circuit in the theaters or, you know, you'd have to go someplace to watch the fight. And then you'd pay like $20 to go to get into the fight. You, you, you weren't born when there was closed circuits. Well, all the yeah, I just started. When you had closed circuits, started at 78? No, I'd say early 70s. Yeah. So like 70, you know, or probably the first, the first Ali Frazier fight, 71. Yeah, 71 probably. Yeah. So, and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then they were figuring out how to deliver it to the homes, you know, the theaters and all this. So anyway, Aram. Bob Arum hired me, 
and was great to me. And then Don hired me, and so that's how I really, you know, became a sportscaster. And and, Crazy. and uh, there was no grand scheme or plan or thought; it just happened by happenstance that Ali came early, and Ali was great to me. And that was my first interview, and Ali, you know, was honored me. All those years later, uh, he let me do his last interview on on television. Um, in 2000, and uh, we took uh, we, uh, we we took America's greatest living Olympians. So we took Muhammad Ali, Ray Leonard, Mary Lou Retton, and Carl Lewis. Carl Lewis, the most decorated track and field. Mary Lou Retton, who would revolutionize gymnastics in this country with the 84 Olympics. Ray Leonard, who was an icon, and then the greatest Ali. And we went up to the Stanford Pool uh, in, uh, in Palo Alto two nights before Michael Phelps left for the Greek Olympics in 2004. That was before he ever won a medal. And we bet that he would be the greatest uh, – swimmer of all time that he would break Mark Spitz's record. Have you ever met Mark Spitz? Yeah. What was the deal with him? Tell me about his personality. What's the story? Let me just finish this. So okay. anyway, that's that, that, that show, at the end of that show, Ali's last words on television in that, in that interview, we had a torch sent to us from the uh, Athens Olympic Organizing Committee. That's the one he had? Yep, and Ali handed that torch and he said, I'm the greatest, you're the latest, it's now up to you. And he handed that torch to Michael Phelps. And now Michael Phelps, all these years later, the most decorated gold medalist in the history of the Olympics. Uh, I think it's 18 gold medals, uh, 22 medals overall. And now that show, when you look at that show, you know, I don't think anything like that could ever happen again. The greatest athlete ever, our greatest Ali, the greatest Olympian ever in, 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 in Phelps. And Carl Lewis, to this day, still the most decorated track and field athlete with nine gold medals. All those broad jumping over four Olympics, you know, starting in Los Angeles, going to Seoul, Barcelona, and Atlanta. So, and Mary Lou Retton, you know, kind of made popular after Olga Corbett and Nadia Comaneci, you know, made gymnastics popular in women's sports. You know, you can kind of trace to her making it. A catapult. So that was proud of that show. What was the question? I was talking to you about Mark Spitz. I always heard rumors about him. He was a nice guy and this and that. And he was nice to me. Yeah. He was nice to me. But he turned down doing that show. He did not want to do that show because he thought it would hurt him commercially. Really? Mm. Yeah. It was the worst decision ever made yeah. by any guy that I. I mean, why would you not want to be on television with Muhammad Ali, yeah. Mary Lou Retton, Carl Lewis, and 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 Ray Leonard? And Michael Spitz. I mean, it's like it's like, and Michael Phelps. I mean, it, it never made any sense. He thought it was going to hurt his commerciality. He thought that it would somehow detract from. I don't know. I can't explain it. But I had I, I talked to him thirty times about the show. He was always very pleasant, but I could never get him to commit to do it. And eventually, he just passed on doing it. And it's kind of sad, but it turns out we didn't need him. <laughs> you know, better off we didn't have him now that we look back on it. Did you know Jackie Robinson? No, sir. No? I know his wife. Yeah. She's great. She's still alive? Yeah. Wow. But I remember, you know who else used to come into Mateo's? Who? Ray Robinson. Really? Oh, Sugar Ray Robinson all the time. Oh, yeah. I don't know when he died. He probably died in 89. the 90s. 89. Okay, 89. I went to his funeral. 89. Yeah, he, he used to come in all the time. Really? Talk to everybody. And, oh, Are yeah, he, he drew a big crowd. Everybody wanted he, You know, they considered him the greatest fighter ever, you know, pound for pound. Why? Well, listen, um, how could somebody's ego handle that? How could what? How could somebody's ego handle that? Being called the greatest fighter of all time. You're the favorite greatest fighter I've ever seen. How could they handle that ego? How, did he, how could he live like that? Wow. That must have been some demons, huh? You know what, though? Huh? Because he had losses. Yeah. You know, the ego is with the zero. Okay? So, like, like look at Floyd. Floyd walks around 50 and 0. Yeah. Okay, wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. So, so that, when, you, when, when you're never defeated, then, you know, you think you never will be defeated. You don't know who you are. Rocky Marciano, I didn't know him, mm -hmm. but he had an O after him, too, right? Yes. Ray, Ray Robinson never had that O. So he knew what it was like to lose. So when he was called the greatest, he could say, well, you know what? That's your assessment may not be my assessment. Because yes. my assessment is I know I lost. How many times did he lose? Oh, he lost around 19 times. Okay, so he lost a lot. Out of 202 fights, the 100 but he lost. knockouts. So yeah. he, he knew what that felt like. 
So uh-huh. anytime somebody might say to him, you're the greatest, he might say, well, I'm going to accept that and thank you, but I know internally better. I tell you a story. Can I tell you a story about yeah, him? Yeah, please. Why somebody? This is just a story. This is just a small part of his career. Why somebody think he might How think he's the greatest? How long is this podcast? Forever. We just, Forever. Know, we just talk all Internally. day. We this is a telethon. This Internally. isn't a podcast. <laughs> this is Ray Robinson. Ray Robinson. Does this get edited? Had, he was forty and zero. So just keep and he talking. Lost the, and he lost one fight to um, Sugar Ray to Jake LaMotta. <laughs> Look at Francis laughing. Go ahead. Having fun. Go ahead. Start Sugar over. Ray I'm Rob, sorry. Sugar Ray Robinson had forty. He was forty and zero. And then he lost the fight to Sugar Ray, um, no, to um, Jake LaMotta, his first loss. And then went like 79 and 0 or something without a loss. How do you do something? I don't think you'd agree. The guy looked so beautiful when he looked like perfection. He was tough and rugged like a dog, competitive. You have to kill him to beat him. It's just really, it's marvelous entertainer. Just watching them fight was just awesome. What do you think of this batch of heavyweights? Hey, I think they have their purpose in their generation. I think they all do. I think since um, Wilder and Tyson Fury had that, that was fight, a great fight, yeah, I think that fight um, cemented them in a generation of great heavyweights. I really believe that. Especially Deontay with, Wilder's a great man. Yeah, really. Yep. I don't know him. It's you nice should. Here. You should. Know. Yeah. You should. You should take the time. You should take the effort, and vice versa. I believe. I think now that you said that. Take it, I'll, I'll look at it from that perspective. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. he's worthy. Yeah, he's worthy, and he's got awesome. you know he's got a, a, a young child who's uh, spinal bifida and so forth, and you know he's uh, been a terrific, uh, terrific father. And I you think know, you're right, and I think I feel that with I think um, Anthony Joshua and Lynx Lewis should talk. I think they have some kind of funny weird beef. Right, and and, and, and I think I don't they know should Joshua. talk. I've, I've met yeah, him a couple he's really times. Really bad. I don't like that. I think they should talk. They shouldn't be like that. These two guys don't. When you mention their name, they huh? You know, it's really not good. And Tyson Fury's an interesting subject too. Oh, he's an awesome guy, though. Yeah, very interesting. Awesome. Uh, his, his 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 background and he, you know, I don't know how that guy got up. That was like that was like unbelievable. Like that was like Frankenstein. It was like, good I, stuff. <laughs> how did this guy get up off the carpet? That was incredible. But anyway, I, uh, but I, but but. Um, yeah, I like these guys. You know, at first I didn't, but I started to respect them after the last fight. I said, wow, this was really awesome. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's good. Boxing needs to have you involved. and For sure. Y- you, you, bring, you bring out in people memories of that are fond to them. So your, your involvement should be important to you because it's important to other people. And if you put an arm around some of these fighters and you give them your respect and your time, I think it would really help the game. And really, as opposed to, you know, so much now, everybody looks back at their generation and says, you know what, we were better. And they get resentful of the money that these guys make and and the attention they get now. But everything's changed. Social media's changed. Television's changed. The delivery of it's changed. Uh, the dollars have changed. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just crazy. Back in your day, when you were fighting for all that money, people looked at you the same. Ali's generation and 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 all those shavers and all those other guys looking at you. And I said, well, he couldn't beat me. They maybe didn't say it, but no, they felt it. Yeah, they had to feel that. Right, because uh, you know, f- but but I think we live in a different time now in a different era, and um, I just think your participation uh, would mean a lot. You know, because you're you're the guy that you're the guy they look at. They're looking at yeah. you on the video games. They're looking at you on that. YouTube. They're looking at you, all these knockouts and everything. And in and, and in many ways, what they want to be is be you. But they can't be you. But they want to have the ability to have your respect. That they can have, but that's up to you. That's weird because you know when I was a young kid, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to lead. And these guys should really let everybody around to know my name. And respect you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't care if they I just wanted them to know my name. <laughs> to know I trained hard. To know I worked hard. I used to go to their restaurants and wait for them outside the restaurants and stuff. Really? Yeah. And, what, and did they know your name? Huh? Did they? No, but I used to just watch them. I used to stalk them and shit. Just watch Tell them. us the story what you decided to put this uh, tattoo on your face. I don't know. I'm, I was supposed to do it earlier. Put a tattoo. I wanted a tattoo on my face. I was supposed to do it earlier, and I, 
I was gonna put a bunch of hearts and shit on my face. There's a bunch of little hearts. And uh, my friends said, nah, man, I'm not gonna do anything whack like that. If I do my art, it's gonna be, you know what I mean, immortal. I don't wanna do no whack. I'm not gonna do whack art. So he, so he said, um, let's let's think about putting a tribal mark or something on there. And I said, okay, we'll, we'll do that. So I, he called me and a couple of days later, he brought up this tribal mark. And so I said, all right, let's do it. And we did it. <laughs> That's happened. You like looking at that? Yeah. You're happy? I'm very happy. You didn't want any more? No. No, I was going to do my whole face at one time. <laughs> I don't know if I want any more. It's a possibility. Did it I might, hurt? I might put a toad on my heart. Did it hurt? I had to my face? No. That didn't hurt? my face. I had one on my stomach that's really painful. Why? Why was that painful? I don't know why. It was. It was just painful. But that one didn't hurt? Not on my face, no. Were you high? I'm smoking. Well, okay, so maybe that took down, that didn't some of the pain? No, because I was smoking when I did my stomach and it just didn't help. <laughs> I like, no! <laughs> stop! You have any tats, Jim? I don't. No. no. No tats. I never had that desire. I've never. Yeah. No. Yeah, that's, that's cool. No, I think it's all fine. Whatever anybody wants to do, Absolutely. I don't cast any aspersions, make any judgments. At all. Every, yeah, I let people you know, live Jim, how they want to live. Jim, you know, listen. Not how I want you know. When, so um, what they want to do is fine. It's great. I want to change the world, you know, Jim. <laughs> I wanted to change the world. I wanted people, they had to accept me who I was. You know, if they want to be in my realm, they want to be in my space, they want to accept me, they have to accept me who I was, who I wanted to be. Did you ever just beat the hell out of somebody? Just, Excuse me? Did you ever, out of the ring, did you ever just beat the heck out of somebody? Just like, you just, somebody yeah. just pissed you off? And yeah, you just beat, yeah, yeah, me. No, oh, come on, I'm talking about, did, like, did you just like see somebody and, you, and, and they did something and they, and forget about the suits or whatever. I mean, did you just ever beat the heck out of somebody and they just took their medicine? Yeah. And what, 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 tell us about it. I always just wondered, is just some guy down the street says something stupid to you or some guy was in your presence in an office or somebody just did something dumb and they got the wrath of the heavyweight champion of the world that they were actually on the receiving end of that without a glove. Listen, I've, 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 um, I've hit a lot of people. I never asked you that question. Yeah, I've hit a lot of people in my life, yeah. Repercussions some and sometimes in different countries and stuff. I, I've hit a lot of people. Lawsuits? Yeah, I've hit a lot but of I people. But I mean, how about just the guy that just took his medicine, that he knew he did something wrong, and you beat him for it, and he just took it. Did you? Did, did, did that happen? I'm sure that happened. I just don't remember that. You know, I remember um, <laughs> for one instance, um, I was in um, like like if some people just have fights. You understand? Mm -hmm. And they don't end up in court over it. It's because they had a disagreement. No, and they settled I always it as end a up fight. in I always end up in court and stuff. <laughs> well, because you uh, they want a payday. Yeah, but I really did bad stuff to them. So oh. beat them up, broke their cheeks and bones or something. Jim, have you heard the story of Mike's first fight ever? In his life? I don't think so. When a kid took his pigeon? Yeah, and killed my bird. And some guy killed my bird and stuff, and I was crying and stuff. How old were you? I must have been 9 or 10. How did he take your bird? Well, um, I had birds um, hitting somewhere in an abandoned building. And I had them an apartment, and somebody told these kids from another neighborhood where my birds went, so they were going up to steal my birds. And uh, one guy snuck one of my birds out. And I had to chase him. I said, give me my bird back. He said, no, you fat fucking nigga. You want this bird? He was black too, but he called me a black fucking nigga. And he broke your bird in half? Ripped, no, ripped the head off. Uh. He moved the bird and shit. Then I, and then the guy said, Mike, fight him. And I fought him. And what happened to that guy? I don't know what he and I beat him up that day, but I don't know what he's doing. Somebody told me he was doing hard times. I would love to see him and stuff. You know his name? Gary Flowers. Gary wow. Flowers. Gary Flowers. Wow. Gary Flowers. Yeah. That's amazing, Mike. You remember his name? Never forget him. Wow. Never forget him. And 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 were you were you involved in boxing at all yet? No, I never had a fight in my life. Okay, and 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 how much longer after that did you go to fight boxing? I probably that sometime that week I started somebody started um giving me money to fight other kids from other neighborhoods. Oh, and so you would beat up a other kids in other neighborhoods? Oh, so I would get beat up, yeah. Why would they beat you up? Because they wanted to fight. Okay, so so who would give you the money? Excuse me? Who would give you money? 
I'm an older kid. He said, you fight him, and if you take this, and you take this, then you'll fight. And how much was the money? Dollar? Dollar, five dollars. Something like that. So this is the in the in in what year? I'm I'm thinking seventy late seventies. Okay. Seventy six. Okay, so you, you started. Who who recognized you were good at this? Other Excuse than me? the kids in the neighborhood, who just, recognized um, you were just good at this? People in the, the it had to be some older kids. The younger kids saw the fight, and they told some people. And, some, and the next thing I know, I saw this older kid came around with the kid that was at the fight, and another kid, and that kid, other kid was for me to fight. So I guess the kid from the fight was telling the older kid about me, and they brought this guy to the neighborhood. So that's why that guy was there with the older kid. And It's like Lord of the Flies. Yeah. yeah. Wow, I can't believe I'm talking about this. Now. I thought, wow, that hit me just now for a minute. That I explained it, that this guy came with this other guy. The young guy showed, told the older guy, and the older guy brought this guy over here. And that's the guy I was supposed to fight because this guy told the older guy about me. And how much older were they? They were like 15. The oldest guy was probably 15. And you were nine? Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody ever steal your pigeons again? Yeah, people stole my pigeons because then it's not about confronting you and stuff. It's about if, you know, they befriend you, you go somewhere, you're not there. Oh, I'm talking about did they ever steal it to taunt no, you? No, nobody okay. ever. Nobody, listen, um, ever since that day, I was known for fighting. People knew who I was. They respect me for fighting and stuff in the neighborhood. Did you know your father? Not well, well. I knew the man who they said my father was. But you were never sure? No. Nah. Did you have a conversation with that man? Yeah. Did you ask him, was, are you my father? Yeah. And what did he tell you? Well, I'm champ of the world. Of course, he'll say yes. <laughs> I'm talking about before then. Never before then. Never before then. I just took it as they say he's my father and my dad. And that was it? Yeah. You didn't want to ask him any questions? No, I did get to know him later and start asking him questions and stuff. Um, not questions I really wanted to know, answers. I didn't really want answers and stuff. It was pretty, it was pretty grim stuff. He was a pretty dark that guy and stuff. Is he alive? No. How long ago did he die? He died in 92. Did he want anything from you? I don't know, because I was offering it too quickly. He never asked. I was offering it too quickly. He never had a chance to ask. Was it weird for somebody to walk into your life when you're a heavyweight champion and say, I'm your father? Hey, um, I wanted to be mean to him and stuff, you know? But I wasn't angry at him. You weren't? No. Were you thankful? Yeah, hey, I was very grateful that he came back in my life at that stage. Not long, but he came back in my life. I was very grateful. I was very kind to him. He didn't have much to tell me, you know. What was his name? His name was Curly Jimmy Kirkpatrick. And did he maintain any relationship any of the time with the, with the woman who was your mother? No. No. They didn't speak to each other. They just handed me over when they finished with me. Your mother? Yeah. And wh what was your relationship like with her? She was loving, but she was kind of aggressive. Never, never, I'm um, pretty much had, um, never had a life together. Never pretty much worked. Wasn't afraid to really beat you, hit me with it, hit you with anything, pretty much. Drank heavily. And see, what had a lot of boyfriends and stuff. A lot of boyfriends and stuff. Sometimes a boyfriend would come over there and be drunk. I would cut their pockets and rob their money. Yeah. That was just the world. And how old, uh, how old were you when your mom died? 16. And that's when Gus, Gus took over? And well, I knew Gus since I was 13. Right. But I mean, a, a major part of your life. And, yeah, and pretty much change. And the uh, people in the Catskills. Well, Cuss, she had, she had pretty much signed me, willed me over, like signed me over to Cuss before she died. What was the lady's name? Camille. Camille. Yes. And she kind of took it from there? Yeah, we had started. And when yeah. did they sign you over? I think I was 16 at the time, 15. What's that feeling like? Excuse me? What's that feeling like 
your mom who you had known, even though she was abusive, and it hit you with a bunch of stuff, and it just kind of said, take him, up. I'm, I'm done. I wanted to show the world who I was. Anybody in the world know my name. And what was your feeling when she passed? Revenge. Is that why you have that sign, the best way to show them is success or whatever it says? No, it's just... Um, best re revenge is success. When I say revenge, revenge was because we never had anything. We never had money. We never had food. We never had anything. So my revenge was having everything. People know my name. How often were you hungry? A lot. But, uh, you know, when you sometimes you get hungry, you, your mind, you, you forget you're hungry and you go to sleep sometimes, you know. People, sometimes people say, um, you, sometimes you, you can't sleep because you're so hungry. I think that was a lie. When you're tired, you sleep, don't care how hungry you are. That's why we run the streets all day, you know. My mother hopes that she, from somewhere, somehow, she'll get some money and bring some money and food home. Don't know how we're going to get it, but whatever you had to do to get it, you got it. Let's take a break. Yeah, man. Well, we can wrap. That's Yo, let's we're wrap good. it. This is just we what we do with talking. Yeah, <laughs> man. And Jim, you being a, such a close friend of Mike, it makes it, you know, you go for hours. So, hey, man, thank you so much thank for coming, Jim. Me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Mike. Brother. You're Anytime. awesome, man. <laughs> Anytime. Well, Mike, great episode, brother. Awesome. That's what you want to do. Take us out, dude. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching another episode of Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson. I'm Eben Britton. I'm Mike Tyson. I'm Jim Gray. And Jim Gray, do they need to, if you want anybody to know where to get in touch with you, how to contact you, anything? Contact Mike. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Check us out. through him. Subscribe on our YouTube channel, Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson. Subscribe on iTunes. Uh, check us out, everybody. Thank you. Out of here. Peace. Look at the girls.